Tonight, I'd like to talk about the pursuit of maturity. Actually, this is the first of what I hope will be a s two or three talks. We'll only get through an introduction and a discussion of infant level maturity uh, today. To start off with, how many of you are familiar with TED Talks? Have you seen TED Talks? Uh, there was a recent TED Talk entitled The Demise of Guys. And it was done by Philip uh, Zimbardo, who was a uh, professor of psychology at Stanford. He's now retired. And he's studied done a, uh, the decline of psychosocial functioning of young males in this culture. And he claims that we're facing an enormous crisis. Uh, in his ebook, based on his TED Talk, Zimbardo maintains that in record numbers, guys are flaming out academically and wiping out socially with girls. Young men are motivated, but just not the way other people want them to be. Society wants guys to be upstanding, proactive citizens who take responsibility for themselves, who work with others to improve their communities, their nation as a whole. Uh, the irony is that society's not giving, he claims, young men the support they need. In fact, society, from politics to the media to the classroom, he maintains, are a major contributor to the demise of men. Here's an example. Uh, by the time the average boy is 21, he's played 10,000 hours of video games. The average male adolescent watches 50 porn videos a week. The porn industry is the fastest growing industry in the United States. Uh, it's currently 15 billion in annual revenue. For every 400 movies made in Hollywood, there are 11,000 porn videos made. And it is so hugely, hugely destructive that I'm going to Call, put a little parenthetical statement and saying you simply must not have computers, uh, iPads, uh, iPhones where boys can get them during the day and they're not, or night and they're not in super, under supervision. It is to put a computer in a 14 year old's room is like putting a stack of Playboys there. And even if you've got security guards on them, I promise you they can break them. There are YouTube videos on how to get around almost any security protocol you can name. The only way to stay safe is to make sure any such media, any such internet access are in very public places. And you put on the uh, security stuff too, just because <laughs> As much redundancy as possible helps. Uh, Zimbardo points out that what's happening to boys particularly is uh, what he calls the cultivation of arousal addictions. An arousal addiction uh, is different from, say, alcohol in that uh, when you have a traditional addiction, you just crave more of the same substance. Uh, an arousal addiction you need variation. You want more and different, more and different. And anytime someone suffers from an addiction, uh, at that point, their maturity level stops. So uh, from years of experience as a counselor, if someone had been, uh, say, an alcoholic for 20 years, if they were now 34 and after 20 years of being an, alcohol, an alcoholic, of alcohol abuse, uh, I knew that emotionally they were 14 years old at best. Because when we start to engage in addictive behavior, at that point, we stop mastering the maturity tasks that we should be mastering. Usually because uh, either there's not the support we need or the maturity tasks are too difficult, and so we opt out with the easy escape uh, of some form of addiction. All that to say, Boys particularly, and girls aren't that far behind, but boys particularly uh, are in crisis. Uh, for example, 
to continue. Uh, this comes from an article entitled Child Man in the Promised Land, appeared in the winter issue of winter 2008 issue of the City Journal. Here's what the author writes. It's 1965, and you're a 26-year-old white male. You have a factory job, or maybe you work for an insurance broker. Either way, at 26, you're married, probably have been for a few years now. You met your wife in high school, where she was in your sister's class. You've already got one child, with another on the way. For now, you're renting an apartment in your parents' two-family house, but you're saving up for a three-bedroom ranch house in the next town. Yes, you're an adult. Now meet the 21st century you, also 26. You've finished college and work in a cubicle in a large Chicago finance office's firm. You live in an apartment with a few single guy friends. In your spare time, you play basketball with your buddies, download the latest indie songs from iTunes, have fun with the Xbox 360, take a leisurely shower, massage some products into your hair and face, and then it's off to the bars and parties where you meet often bed girls of widely varied hues and sizes. They come from everywhere, California, Tokyo, Alaska, Australia, wife, Kids? House? Are you kidding? Not so long ago, the average mid-20-something had achieved most of life's milestones. High school degree, financial independence, marriage, and children. These days, he lingers happily in a new hybrid of semi-hormonal adolescence and quasi-responsible self-reliance. Decades in unfolding this limbo may not seem like news to many, but in fact, it is the early 21st century, it is to the early 21st century what adolescence was to the 20th. In other words, prior to the 20th century, adolescence did not exist. No such thing, the word teenager wasn't a part of the vocabulary till post-World War II. And now we're seeing this phenomena increase well into, through, throughout the 20s. Um, it's what David Brooks calls now the odyssey years, the 20s. No longer are you an adult. You're continuing on functioning effectively as a 16-year-old did 50 years ago. Uh, just an interesting statistic. In 1970, 69% of 25-year-olds and 85% of 30-year-olds were married. In 2000, only 33% of 25-year-old men and 58% of 30-year-olds are married, respectively. Now, that's a huge, huge demographic shift in less than 30, in just 30 years. Somehow, our young men, particularly, are giving up on adulthood. And if you want a sign of that, next time you're, you know, if you're watching television, you will never see a 20-something male functioning as an adult. Just put it to the text. Next time you see it, you're watching television, commercial comes on, you won't see a 20-something male. And usually, you will see very, very weak, quasi-men. To, f to find a, tr uh, a man functioning traditionally as a man did uh, or should, you won't see it on television. Interestingly, uh, here's a couple other statistics. Uh, once upon a time, video games were for little boys and little girls, for little boys particularly, well, mostly boys. Uh, they'd have the Nintendos. Now, the number one market for video games is men age 18 to 34. They're the biggest gamers. According to Nielsen, Almost half, 48.2% of American males in that age bracket have used a console during the last quarter of 2006 and did so on average for two hours and 43 minutes per day. That's 18 to 34-year-olds. That's 13 minutes longer than the 12 to 17-year-olds did who evidently have more responsibility than today's 20-somethings. Uh, 
Uh, on the other end, you know, we're supposed to go f through maturity to function at the end of our life as elders in the community. Another time we'll talk more about what the vision of being an elder and of actually raising children who one day will function as elders in a community might be like. But just to give you, again, some of the data. In the five years from 2005 to 2009, the number of recorded cases of syphilis and chlamydia among those 55 and older increased 43%. According to the Orlando Sentinel's analysis of data provided by the CDC, in a particular community, the Villages, which is between Orlando and Ocala, Florida, during that same time period, there was a 71% increase in STDs. And you have to say, what has gone wrong in a culture where now 55-year-olds their vision is to regress back to an adolescent state. And you have epidemics of STDs among those over 55. Again, something's happened to the vision of what maturity might be or ought to be, of where we're going and how we should best live. Now, I would say that in a highly indulgent consumption-oriented society, the giving up of childish ways is a challenging task. It requires concerted effort on the part of both young and old. In other words, no one comes to maturity without help. It's not a task to be done alone. And we here at Ambleside agree with Charlotte Mason's words when she says, to assist and direct the evolution of character is the chief office of education. That our chief goal is to cultivate maturity among your children. Because if that happens, everything else will take care of itself. If you have an 18-year-old who actually functions like a man or like a woman, they will do just fine in college. The most difficult thing will be dealing with all the man boys and woe girls that surround them because they will be a rare breed if they're actually functioning like a man or like a woman. But that's our goal. Well, let me shift gears here and talk more specifically about maturity. What we mean by it, what we don't mean by it, what the stages of maturity are, and then more specifically, what the tasks at the infant level of maturity are. Because many, many 30-year-olds have not mastered the infant level maturity tasks, as you, you'll see when we get to them. First, maturity versus other developmental tasks. Uh, one developmental task is physical development. I mean, our bodies are meant to grow. But given a reasonably healthy physical environment and sufficient food and room to exercise and places to, to walk and to run and to sprawl. Given general physically healthy conditions, physical development happens. You, most of us have not had to worry about our children growing up physically. Also, Age-appropriate cognitive and neuromotor skills are important. At a certain age, you round one, plus or minus, a little after, we start to learn to walk, right? That is an important neuromotor skill, very complex. It's not the same thing as maturity, but it is an important developmental skill. Uh, how to talk, a little later, how to cook a meal, 
uh, how to solve a trig problem. Some of us haven't mastered that yet. But these are all cognitive motor and motor development skills, right? The confusion that we make is we tend to think if a person has a certain physical development and has, developed, and has mastered certain cognitive skills, in other words, they know how to drive a car, uh, they know how to uh, write an essay, they're lucent in conversation, they've mastered certain skills, we assume they're at that same level of maturity. And it's absolutely not the case. You can have a very healthy 24-year-old body that knows how to do a lot of stuff, but is functioning emotionally, relationally like a two-year-old. So, what do we mean by maturity? By maturity, we mean mastering age-appropriate emotional relational skills. Notice that's different. And emotional relational skills are different from how do I speak a foreign language? How do I drive a car? And one of the mistakes we've made as a culture is we have systematically ignored the importance of those skills. We've assumed that somehow they would just happen. Something akin to physical development. My child develops physically, I just feed him, and so he's going to develop emotionally, relationally. He will naturally mature. And it doesn't happen that way. That's why we get 30-year-olds who function like 3-year-olds. So, a quick overview of the levels of maturity. First, there's the infant level. That's 0 to 3 years old. And by these levels, it's really the time in which you've got certain developmental tasks to accomplish. So an infant, age zero to three, ideally, based on their brain structures and brain development, has certain emotional relational tasks to accomplish. Between the ages of four and 12, they now have sufficient cognitive develop brain development that they can now accomplish the child maturity tasks. Obviously, when you start at four, you haven't mastered all the child maturity tasks. But you now have at least the brain apparatus to do that. Age 13 to one's first child, the adult stage of development. Notice. No adolescent. There is no, we are not wired for a stage of adolescence. All adolescence is, is a refusal to take up the adult tasks. So I'm older, but I'm still playing around with the child developmental task or the infant developmental tasks. Adult 13 to 14, and 13 to first child. And then from that point on, parent level of maturity. And that's first child until the departure of the youngest child from the home. Again, certain emotional, relational tasks to be mastered. And then finally, the final stage of one's life, ideally we function as an elder. Uh, later on I'll talk about child, adult, parent, and elder stages, but today I want to just focus on the infant level of maturity. So what are the infant maturity tasks? Now, what is it that between the birth and the end of one's third year of life, the child ideally should accomplish? 
First, first task. This is the task that, that immediately after a child is born, most important thing to the child, what the child's wired for. And that is, the most important first thing is to joy bond. Now, the first question on a child's mind, it's obviously pre-verbal, when a child is born, is to whom do I belong? Because I can't do life by myself. So to whom do I belong? And looks up into the face of mom and then in the face of dad. Ah, you're the ones to whom I belong. In fact, neuroscientists have identified a part of the brain uh, called the thalamus, which is at the top of the brain stem. And it, some developmental neuroscientists call that the center of the attachment light. In other words, it's, it's, it's on this quest it's, it, to identify to whom I belong. Because that person's going to tell me how to do life. No child is born knowing how to do life. Who's going to tell me? The one to whom I belong. And what is critically important is that when the one to whom I belong looks down upon me, I see a bright, smiling face that says, gee, I'm glad we belong together. Now that's hugely important. It's hugely important for parents. It's hugely important for teachers. Joy, and I don't mean happiness, joy is that we belong together. Joy is the oil in the crankcase of life. Take a classroom that's low joy, everything, the gears start to grind, everything starts to come true. Take a family that's low joy, everything starts to grind to a halt. Don't mean happiness, every family goes through sadness. Joy, that sense of, isn't it good that we are together? I belong to you, you belong to me, isn't it good? And a, jo and a child look up and see that? See, a child looks up and sees the one that I belong to go bright-faced? That's huge. You can face anything if the person you belong to is bright-faced. So that actually gives us a bit of a challenge to be bright-faced people. Doesn't mean that we're not sad. In fact, when one, as one is mastering the parent developmental tasks, one of the things one learns to do is to be sad together and still bright-faced. Because if I have to go through this sadness, I wouldn't want to go through this sadness with anybody else but you. Good to be together. I belong to you. You belong to me. Number one task to joy bond. Earliest thing on a newborn's mind. Second thing is to develop trust. Now the one that I belong to, can I trust them? Are they reliable? Are the big people in my life trustworthy? If so, I can develop the neurological structures, the, the neural networks, the brain wiring that allows me to trust. There's actually a part of the brain. Now, all of this is somewhat tentative because the brain is the most complex thing in the universe. There's nothing more complex than the human brain. But there seems to be a little almond straight shaped structure in the limbic system called the amygdala that seems to be part of this process, particularly uh, in a, a very young infant. And what the amygdala tends, seems to do is tag significant persons as good, bad, or scary. And one of the most destructive things in a child's life is when the one I belong to gets tagged as bad or scary. That, that will make life very, very painful and very, very difficult. 
However, if the one to whom I belong gets tagged as good, well, now we've got a solid foundation to build on. Second developmental task, to trust. To trust. The third developmental task, to begin to organize myself, my, my core self into a personality. In other words, I start to have consistency in response patterns. So the way I live is not random. The way I live starts to have a certain coherence to it. And that is done through imitation. Principally of the ones imitating the ones to whom I belong and the community to whom I belong. How do I know to look someone in the eyes when they address me? How do I know that? I only know that because the community to which I belong has the habit when someone addresses, we look at each other in the eyes. Now that's an enormous amount of information. And so for some children, it can cause a little bit of overload and takes more practice and more time. But there are a few, actually there are a few things as important as eye contact. Have you ever been in a group where all the children simply ignore the adults? Where they act as if there's no adult there? In fact, often, sometimes you're in groups where they're acting as if there's nobody else there that matters. Again, they have not had the right kind of community surrounding them to cultivate the right kind of sense of self. Who I am is who I am, not just me alone, but it's also who I am with you. It's who we are together. And there are certain ways we respond to one another certain cues we give one another. Third developmental task, to begin to organize myself into a coherent person, and that's principally through imitation. Fourth, to, I learn how to regulate and quiet every emotion. Every, uh, the, uh, I should say, not every emotion, particularly the six painful primary emotions. So if you're human, you experience sorrow, anger, fear, hopelessness, disgust, and shame. Those are the painful six. And the interesting thing is, they all seem to be principally processed in something called the right cingulate gyrus. That's a part of the brain. You've got two of them. You've got a right and a left. And it's on the top of the limbic system, just below the cerebral cortex. And they run from behind your eyes to the back of your head. So think bananas. So you've got two bananas in your brain. And the one on the right, the right cingulate gyrus, that seems to be, for, in most people, the core center for emotional self-regulation. Here's the interesting thing. It is almost completely undeveloped at birth. That it is, that it differentiates and, and so becomes sophisticated and takes its formal shape in the early, in those first three years, actually first 18 months. And that's the part of the brain that processes emotional distress and allows you to stay your best self. So, ask yourself the question, on a scale of one to 10, how well do I emotionally self-regulate on a consistent basis? And what happens when my cingulate gyrus gets, goes bright red because, on a PET scan because it's overtaxed? Well, the children, they're not, they're not born knowing how to experience sorrow and not completely unwind. 
How do, how do you experience sorrow and, and stay your true self? In other words, stay your real personality. How do you do that? It's a learned skill. It's a maturity task that ideally is accomplished significantly by the age of three. Now, as you can imagine, as a culture, we're not doing real well on that one. But in terms of our brain wiring, we're made to have mastered that task significantly. Now, there's always extremes that put us to the test. Uh, but we, we talk of capacity. I mean, how big is your cup before you stop being your best self? And generally, of the six painful emotions, we do some better than others. Like some of us do sorrow real well. Give me a lot of sorrow and I can stay my best self. Some of us, uh, I can really be angry, but I'm not going to stop being my best self. Others can do shame well. or But sometimes we have a, a weak link where maybe... For me, example, I think I've told you that. For me, of the six, shame is the one that I have spent the most time over the last 30 years working on so that I could handle shame and stay my best self and uh, not be run into the ground if I get in a shameful situation, shame-filled situation. I could still respond lovingly and graciously and kind rather than becoming reactionary. 30 years ago, you put me in shame. I would not have stayed my best self. On the other hand, I've always been pretty good at sorrow. That's a gift of my parents. My parents did sorrow very well. So I do sorrow very well. Uh, my, my parents didn't do shame so well, so I didn't learn how to do shame so well. Interestingly, though, so we can learn from others. So it doesn't mean just because we've got a weakness, we're done. So for all of us, you know, uh, we can continue to grow in these maturity tasks. The next developmental task. Oh, and I should say, I mean, think about your own children and ask yourself, what is their capacity? How well do they emotionally self-regulate? And one of the sad things is now we tend to medicate rather than cultivate the skills of emotional self-regulation. And so we suppress rather than... Uh, medication doesn't treat. In very rare cases does it treat. It does compensate in the, when we talk about psychotropic meds. That's a whole other discussion. So again, I'm not totally against them, but they're vastly overprescribed, and that, that would be a whole other discussion when such meds are appropriate, and how do we really know what we're doing. Uh, but though the skill of emotionally self-regulating can be learned over time, and it is essential. There are a few tasks, so, but, I mean, think of those in the workplace. I mean, you, you all know people who don't emotionally self-regulate well. What kind of an employee are they? We all know, we probably all know those buttons we can push on our spouses, which will get them to not emotionally self-regulate so well. Right? Or the buttons they push on us. Uh, let, let me tell you, anytime you cease being your best self, or I cease being my best self, that's my issue, it's not my wife's issue. If I stop emotionally self-regulating well and staying my best self, my wife might have pushed my buttons, but she's not responsible for whether I'm an adult. She's not responsible for whether I'm emotionally self-regulating well. And if I have an area of immaturity, that's mine to own and mine to work on. Now, it'd be nice if she worked on not pushing my buttons. That might be supportive and helpful, but still... Actually, I think that's one of the things God does. God gives us someone who will push our buttons so we have to grow up. I think that's part of the plan. Uh, it's 
it's not just for all the great benefits and blessings, it's not for the good things, but it's also to have someone that will push our buttons and force us to grow up where we're still immature. Uh, next developmental task, returning to joy from every, one of, from every emotion so that I can actually feel in a distressed state and I know how to go from not to get stuck in that and spin farther and farther and farther down. I know how to feel something distressing and move it in another direction. Here's a big one that's related to these. There's a lot of overlap over these. The peaceful acceptance of no. Actually, between two and three, Hugely important developmental task that a child learn to peacefully accept no. And if you, do, if you learn it, actually at two is the easiest time to learn it. At 30, it's much more difficult to learn to peacefully accept no. And we've all probably met 30-year-olds who don't peacefully accept no. I mean, just think about it. Just that one thing. How much better life would be if you're, is if you're one of those who peacefully accepts no, doesn't get bent out of shape, understands that you can't always do what you want. You don't always get what you want. You peacefully accept no. And again, here's the cue. You never learn that unless you experience it. I mean, there, there's a whole instruction out there in certain circles that tell parents never to tell, if possible, never tell your children no. That's a disaster. Because if they never hear no, they never learn to peacefully accept no. And then they get out into the world. And the world's not going to say yes to them all the time. And when they get married, to be married to someone who doesn't peacefully accept no is extraordinarily difficult for everybody. It's a two-year you know, ideal. You're not, really, you're not really equipped to learn it until you're about two, and it should take a year in most cases. I mean, we all develop differently at different rates, so sometimes it might take a little longer. But ideally, by three, we can peacefully accept no. Got that? If, you, if you're three years old and you can peacefully accept no, you can emotionally self-regulate well, and you have a sense of a coherent personality and what it means to be you, and how our people live, you are set up. I mean, you are ready to do life. Another task, to master the body. To be able to sit still and master your body. To make it do what it needs to do. It's actually a very complex task, right? We've talked about this before. It involves balancing the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems in a narrow sweet spot that keeps me at an appropriate level of physical arousal for the task at hand. So I'm not sleeping and I'm not bouncing. I am awake and sitting still. That is a very complex task. It is also extraordinarily difficult to accomplish if you're spending most of your time in front of television screens or other, other kinds of screens. Because what's, what those kinds of media do is they emotionally regulate us. And because they're emotionally regulating us, if I'm two years old and I'm in front of a screen, and the content may be benign, but the screen itself is now emotionally regulating me, and if every time I get upset, mom puts me in front of a screen so that the screen can emotionally regulate me, what don't I learn? I don't learn how to emotionally self-regulate. I'm always regulated by a screen. To master my body so that my arms and legs aren't flailing everywhere in every direction. Now again, like all things, some of these tasks are easier for certain children, some of them more difficult for other children, some take a little time. 
it doesn't take us off the hook. Sometimes we get naturals, right? You know what a natural is? The natural is the, the four-year-old or who picks up a baseball and for the first, first throw it's, you know, 15 feet straight into his father's glove, first time. That's a natural. What do most four-year-olds do? They pick up the ball and it goes that way, that way, that way. Some of them, it's, some of them within a few weeks. Some of them it's going to take 20 minutes a day, three times a, three times a week for a year before they become proficient in that neurophysiological skill. All right. We all have strengths. We all have weaknesses. We all develop at a different rate. But the tasks remain the same. Here's another one. To learn to rest. To emotionally self-quiet. That's something that no baby's born knowing how to do. How does a child learn? Learns from a bonded relationship with someone who knows how to do it. How to go from a high energy state to a low energy state. Complex task. Another thing is to, to cultivate curiosity. The three-year-old should be enormously curious. Have intimate relationships with many things. How does that happen? Well, it needs someone to joy bond with them in exploration. Right? I, I remember as a child, uh, we were reading Charlotte's bed, Web. I remember climbing into the bed with my mother and my four younger siblings at the time. And we're all surrounding mom every night, and she's reading Charlotte's Web. I mean, I'm six years old. So we must have been six, five, four, uh, two, and newborn. And so we're reading Charlotte's Web. And we notice a couple of days later that on the side next to our front door was a big spider web. What did we name the spider? Charlotte, of course, right? You see, as I was joyfully bonded with my mother, we also joyfully then bonded and were curious about spiders and books and all kinds of wonderful things. Where children are made to be curious, but if it's not cultivated, it's the old neuroscience principle of use it or lose it. If you've got a neural network, if you don't, Use it, it starts to degrade. So these are the tasks. And, and imagine if, you're th- if you've got a three-year-old who's highly curious, who can go from excitement to rest, has mastered his body, uh, joy bonds well with the important people, trusts easily, has organized himself, himself into a, a co- coherent personality, can regulate and quiet his emotions, returns to joy well, and peacefully accepts no. How well is that child going to do in life? I mean, you got those skills down at three. You're set up. You get them down at eight. You're ready to go. And if it takes to 12, okay, but let's get them done. Pity the 30-year-old who has not mastered these skills. So what do we do? And we'll end with this. How do we cultivate emotional maturity? First, emotional relational skills must be passed on relationally. We get them from those with whom we have bonded relationships. You cannot give a lecture about an emotional, relational, or a maturity skill and expect it to take. We get it by being bonded with someone who has the skill. And most of the transfer is unconscious. Now for that to happen, we actually have to have time together. We actually, children need time with you. They need time with others. And 
when you look at the data and you compare the number of hours children have with screens as compared to the number of hours they have with dad or mom, I mean, it's hugely out of whack. Hours a day of screen time, a few minutes at best a day with dad. Screens are useful purveyors of information. They are useful purveyors of information. They are not capable of passing on emotional relational skills. Can't be done. They can emotionally regulate us, but they can't teach us how to emotionally self-regulate. First thing, they're only passed relationally, that means time. And beyond time, it requires high joy relationships. If I'm in a low joy state, it is unlikely you will learn anything from any emotionally relationally. Because if you sense I'm in a low joy state, everything's going, danger, danger, shields up. Right? And if I'm a child, it's the big brain in the house is in a dangerous state, shields up. I'm not going to learn anything emotionally, relationally at that point, but perhaps to try to how to hide and run away. But nothing useful in terms of maturity. So this, only, this emotional, tr relational transfer of maturity skills only happens when we're in a high joy state. And that doesn't mean effervescent. It doesn't mean bubbly. Some of us are more effervescent. I'm not particularly an effervescent personality. That's not what it means. What it means is, hey, good to be me here with you. I'm cool. I love you. I'm with you. I'm for you. You know what you did? That ain't going to stand. But I'm with you and I'm for you. I'm not, I'm not in danger of brain dysfunction right now. And guarantee every child knows when there's an adult in the room who's in danger of brain dysfunction. Every child reads it. And every child immediately says, danger, danger, shields up. How do I stay safe here? So it requires to be bonded, to be bonded with someone who's high joy, and to be bonded with someone who's got the relational skill that I don't have. So as long as I don't know how to do shame real well, I'm not going to be very helpful to anybody else learning it. So if I've got a weakness, I need to go to school myself. Another way to say it is that we learn relational, emotional skills largely in, through unconscious processes of imitation in people we're bonded with. That's how we learn them. Uh, mind sight is hugely important. By that, do you, by mind sight, do you know the term? It, it means my capacity to be aware of what's happening in me and to be aware of what's really happening in you. It requires a certain pause so that if I know I'm about to go into brain dysfunction, I can at least call an internal timeout. I'm aware of what's happening in me, and I'm aware, and I'm seeing, okay, my child right here, we, I can see it in the eyes, I can see it in the face. If we're about to go into major meltdown road, mode, uh, his frontal lobes are about to shut down, he's about to become a puddle of goo on the floor. This is probably not the time for a lecture. So I, what, what is needed here right now is attunement, comfort, a sense of safety, so that we can kind of get out of panic mode and then maybe do some transfer into the necessary skills. Uh, so mind sight, I'm aware of what's happening with me, I'm aware of what's happening in you. It, it requires the transmission of an idea. But now notice, most of these ideas about how to do life or manage they are, they're ideas, but most of them are not verbal ideas, and most of them are primarily unconscious, nonverbal. But a conscious verbal idea can set up the unconscious for learning an emotional relational skill. For instance, 
some of the teachers have been talking to, throughout the Ambleside Network, have been talking to their students about homeostasis. You know, the balancing of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems at a sweet spot that allows you to stay quiet but focused. And so they're actually then practicing homeostasis. You know, and if you're six year old, I'm practicing homeostasis here right now. I mean, they get that idea and that can help you learn a skill. Now, a lecture doesn't help anybody learn an emotional relational skill. The sharing of an idea that can make sense of life to a child can then set them up and facilitate the learning of an emotional relational skill. And finally, practice. Practice, practice, practice. That's how we learn anything. Anything that has to be encoded in a neural network in our brain is learned through practice. And you don't get to practice unless we're together and uncomfortable stuff happens. Uncomfortable. We've made this huge mistake with childhood in trying to keep all the uncomfortable stuff out of children's lives. And we've made them completely incapable of dealing with life because uncomfortable stuff happens in life. Again, that's different from trauma. We protect children from trauma. It is every adult's responsibility to protect every child from trauma. We don't protect them from uncomfortable stuff. We walk with them through them. We, we attune with them in the midst of the uncomfortable stuff and we help them to learn how to process it and how to grow up and how to mature. Now that's the infant level tasks. And you can imagine, get those down by three and you're set because the rest will come pretty easily. All right, that's the thought for tonight. And thanks so much. And I'm two minutes over time, so please forgive me. But great to be with y'all.